I think that a society that does not have these moral absolutes is in deep trouble. And so when I, when I open the Old Testament and, and when I look at the texts saying if you lay siege to a city you can you can kill if, if the Lord delivers it into your hand you can kill the men and the women. If you're already not coming from the presupposition that the Bible's good, that God is good, that religion is good, Alex has, has a point here. But before we get into that guys, my name is Ruslan. This channel exists to encourage, empower, and inspire you to live a life that blesses God. If you're not new here, consider subscribing. What, what are you doing? All right, let's jump into the video. Uh, so there, there are many problems with the motivism. Alistair McIntyre does a good job sort of breaking down the problems with the motivism. Um, but the the sort of idea that there have to be certain moral absolutes that are beyond contention. Right. And those moral absolutes have to be universally accepted. You can ground that, I suppose, in a sort of descriptive universe. The problem is that, to go back to your example, which again, I think is a really interesting one, if a man comes to kill me. I think the, the, the real question of religion versus non-religion in the utility sphere here mm -hmm. is, is it more likely that a man is gonna come to kill you being a, a devotee of a religion that says that he must kill you or is it more likely that a man is going to kill you out of self-interest because he is not a devotee of a, of a God who says that killing is wrong? It's a great question. Who's more likely to commit heinous act? People who follow a religion that says to kill you or people who have no religion and no moral bounds and don't see right from wrong as any certainty? So if you are faced with these two alternatives, uh, to kind of remove your example one step, the question is why the man has come to kill you. I mean, that's that's... The, the, your premise is the man has come to kill you because God told him to, and so he can't be dissuaded by force. Agreed. We see that full scale in the real world on a fairly regular basis. It is also true that over the course of human history, men have come to kill one another on the basis of self-interest right. an extraordinary amount of the time. Right. Tribal self-interest particularly, right. having no particular relationship with God, just the idea that I want to kill you over territory, I want to kill you over resources, I want to kill you because you're not a member of my immediate kin family or because you killed a member of my kin family and so in revenge I need to kill a member of your kin family. The entire, to, to borrow from your language, the entire sort of evolution of religion on a utility basis would have been to create moral absolutes that are applicable more broadly to then, than to you and your friends. Any morality that can be created on an individual level right. is inherently dangerous because you can immediately graft that morality onto your personal self-interest. The entire purpose of religion, whether you want to ground that in evolutionary brain functionings or whether you want to ground that in revelation, the entire purpose of religion on a utility level is to remove morality from the purview of my special interest mm -hmm. and to say, here are things that I cannot do, even if yes. they are in my interest, yes. because there is a higher power that says I cannot do these things. This is going to be controversial. Those of you guys that keep up with the red pill understand that the red pill talks about how the biological wiring of a man is to deposit as much seed as he can into as many women as he can and, and have as many offspring as he can. That is in his best self-interest. However, they would say stuff like monogamy is not natural for men. However, we know that what's most optimal for the flourishing of a family unit is actually a monogamous relationship, a monogamous marriage, one man, one woman to create offspring for one life. That isn't necessarily evolutionary optimal, if we're going to look at it that way. Do, do, does, a, does a man who's just trying to act in his best self-interest have as many, uh, because if the, if the interest is to reproduce yourself, that's what you're naturally wired to do, have as many offspring with as many women as possible because it feels good and because it, it, it gets his, sows his royal oats? Or do you do the counter, which is settle down and love on one woman, serve one woman to have a family with. One is directly correlated from a New Testament Christian virtue ethic. The other one is correlated from Alex's conclusion of just do whatever naturally feels good and the wiring that you have. Why, why be monogamous? Now what happens when there isn't monogamy in a society? Well, welcome to America where there's a bunch of kids being born out of wedlock, fathers not in the homes, and all of the institutional damage that does, that does, this, that does to a society. Right? These are the logical implications when you just go off of your carnal, fleshly, instinctual desires. I think that a society that does not have these moral absolutes is in deep trouble. A society that, that refuses to say that there are certain absolutes that cannot be crossed under any circumstances right. that are universally applicable, right. it reduces things that we all take for granted, like equal justice before the law, like the idea that the law is supposed to equally apply to everybody, whether right. they're a member of your family or whether they're not. And there are broad cultural differences in these questions. I mean, to pretend that all human societies have equality under law is obviously not true. It's not remotely true, actually. Uh, there's a, a very good book called The Weirdest People in the World, all about the idea that we in the West have this sort of ethnocentric view of ourselves where we think everybody thinks like people in the West. But right. the truth is that because we are Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, we have particular views of the world. Those views are drawn from a particularistic tradition. That particularistic right. tradition is biblical in nature. I mean, yes. it is Judeo-Christian in nature 
even if you're just describing European society or American society, historically speaking. The West thinks that the rest of the world thinks like us. The rest of the world doesn't. The, the hubris that we exhibit is like, we think that everyone thinks like that and everyone doesn't think like us. Because of how much influence the church, the Bible has, I'm not saying we're a Christian nation, but there's a lot of influence here. The rest of the world doesn't think like us. So the, the kind of removal of God from the equation, your suggestion is that God makes a person impervious to countervailing responses. And my answer is yes, God does make a person impervious right. to countervailing responses, including the evils of one's own heart, if you truly believe that God is standing above you telling you not, not to do that thing. And again, social science tends to bear this out. People who believe that, that God is, is above them tend to give more charity, for example. People who tend to live inside religious communities in religious within the religious community and I, again i'm not going to pretend that i think all religions are equivalent in their in their truth propositions because i don't i mean i if, if i did i wouldn't be wearing a yarmulke right so <laughs> inside religious communities a lot of social bonds and a lot of social frameworks are built on the basis of this shared belief system right, right. in other words diversity itself diver self-interest cannot always check self-interest and it tends to tear apart societies and communities unless there is an orienting goal. That orienting goal traditionally has been performed by church. It's been traditionally performed by the idea that you are serving God together. And because of that, people build these, these social bonds, including the institutions of police, for example, to, to prevent. Right. And so I, th I think Ben Shapiro is cooking and uh, Alex never really has a great response to this, but it's true. Who gives the most to charities? Who does the most philanthropy work? Who gives away the, who serves the poor, right? It's not secular humanist. It's not atheist. So I think, I think Alex is kind of cornered. He doesn't really have a good response. Now, here's the one part of the conversation where Alex has a great challenge for Ben Shapiro, if I'm honest with you guys. And it, it's, it, it is challenging. Ben Shapiro puts up a good argument in terms of incrementalism, right? God revealing himself through incrementalism. This is going to be the last part we'll look at. And so when I, when I open the Old Testament uh, or the Hebrew Bible, and, and when I look at the texts saying that you, you, if you lay siege to a city, you can you can kill if if the Lord delivers it into your hand, you can kill the men and the women, uh, but keep or you can kill the men and keep the women and the children and the and the and the livestock as plunder, as Deuteronomy says. And and uh, the, in the very next verse, uh, sorry, the very next chapter says that you know if if you see a good-looking woman. And, and I'm not I'm not interjecting that if, if somebody finds an attractive woman. Yes, if you is the actual Hebrew, yeah. then, then they can take them for themselves. And if they want them as their wives and they, they take them home, they shave their head, they cut off their fingernails, they give them 30 days to mourn mm -hmm. their old husband who you may very well have just killed. And then you can take them as your wife. When Numbers 31 has Moses instruct the, the slaughter of the Midianites saying, kill all the men, and this time the women get killed too, but not the women who haven't slept with a man. And why might that be? And it says that, you know, keep them for yourselves. And I, I hear all the time that this is some kind of liberalizing process. Maybe it's because, you know, these, these people wouldn't survive on their own. It's some kind of protective measure to make sure that you're, you're looking after them. If that's the case, then why does it only apply to the virgins? That seems a little bit suspect to me. You know, in, in, uh, it's it sort of, uh, Scripture is littered with these, with these kinds of with these kinds of well, again, so to, to go back to the so Alex is going to some of the hard passages in scripture that he references, and those are real verses. And so Ben Shapiro is going to give a response. I don't know if this is the sh strongest response, but this is a response I've heard. Okay, and I think this is, if I'm just being objective, one of the the if there's any weak parts of the argument for Ben Shapiro, it would be this part of the aspect. I, I actually think I think his response is is fine and reasonable, but I'm already bought into the idea of there being a God and theism and the Bible being true. Uh, but if someone isn't, this is this is some hard stuff to wrestle through. The sort of oral tradition. Nature and I don't think God would would permit a, a, a proactive immorality, even if he can't, for some reason, abolish the practice altogether. If well, you see what I'm so he's saying there are parts in the Bible that God permits immorality, but he's not abolishing it all the way out, right? And so watch Ben Shapiro's response here. I mean Sorry. the, well, no, that last point I don't see. So the the when, when you say even if he can't abolish the practice altogether, well. Which already, no, I, I mean, think, he would be able to do. Right. So, the, so the, the question is whether he can or whether he can't. If he can't abolish the practice, then the idea of wooing people away from a particular type of sin through a through a gradualistic process is known throughout societies across human history. I mean, the gradualistic processes are the way that, that most things get done. So Ben Shapiro is saying that God, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, goes through a process, specifically with, thing, with a thing like slavery, through something called incrementalism. Incrementally, God removes certain aspects of society that are not within his moral code. So we would put slavery in this category. We would put polygamy in this category. These things were not initially designed. Humans were not supposed to own humans. 
men weren't supposed to have multiple wives, but because the society allowed it to be such, incrementally God is removing certain aspects, okay? And so this is kind of what Ben Shapiro is getting to. Across human history. And by the way, the, the, the universal practice, unfortunately, up till today in many places in the world is in fact the extreme version of what you're talking about. Raise everything, kill everyone. Right? That, that sort of stuff, unfortunately, does take place. For all of society, the West is unique in this. Planet Earth, even in the year 2023. And so the idea of a culture arising from the Bible that not only abolished slavery on its own shores, but then abolished slavery literally everywhere else, mm -hmm. which is what Great Britain did. Right. That, again, to, to separate that off from a tradition that also says that every human being is made in the image of God, right, which, which is the verse from Genesis, or, or that you have to treat the stranger well, right, which is repeated more than any injunction in the Bible, right? Th there are these, these traditions that are, that are at war with each other inside the Bible, which is why there is this hotly fought kind of argument inside biblical circles about all of this stuff, which again is one of the reasons why I said right up top that when it gets to I can't just open the Bible and interpret the text as I would see fit. You say, well, I, I don't like this verse right here. Contradictory? I'm, what was that? You, you say that scripture is contradictory? Well, I, it's a good question, right? Now listen how Ben answers this. I say that, that scripture is, some, some scripture is time bound and some scripture is not. So the, the, the easy one that, the, the sort of easy way to distinguish is that when the Bible says not to do a thing, mm -hmm. then that tends to be non-time bound. And when it says to do a thing. And when it says to do a thing, that may be a temporary permission structure, mm -hmm. but it, it so when the Bible says don't do a thing, that's absolute. Don't commit murder, that's absolute. But when it says to do a thing, or you can take the virgins, Ben Shapiro is saying that might be only for a specific time, for a specific purpose, for a specific culture, for a specific context. It could also be a wooing. A wooing. And by, by the way, again, I'm not speaking out of turn here. This has been uh, 1,500 years of Jewish reinterpretation of Ashley Fatoar, to take a quick example, right? That, sorry, the, 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 uh, the war bride. Uh, that, like the, the, the longstanding Talmudic tradition, which again is almost 2,000 years old at this point, is that that was deliberately an attempt to avoid mass war, which again, you can you can scoff at that, but mass war happened on this continent 70 years ago when the Russians literally ran everyone <laughs> as they came into Germany. So, Darkness. so Ben Shapiro is saying like in war, in battle, there's going to be these things that are going to go haywire like mass scrape, but God is par creating parameters around how to avoid these things in the things he's permitting them to do. Same thing with slavery, same thing with polygamy. You know, the, these evils continue to exist in the human heart. Even if this was a liberalizing force, and even if this was uh, not as bad as other slavery, do you think that the ownership of other human beings under the conditions of the Hebrew Bible are immoral? Yes. So, so owning people is always immoral, always immoral, yet there's permissions given for it. How do you account for God commanding something, which you now see to be, or, or, or rather permitting something, and explicitly and giving you details about how to do something, which is proactively immoral. Because permitting, he's not permitting me, per permitting my great, 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 Alex says, now who's the moral relativist? But Ben Shapiro says, you're, you're living off of our foundation, right? This is a good exchange. Well, who's the moral relativist now? I mean, it's a good, I mean, again, if there's ever a weak point in this conversation, I think Alex has a, has, has a point here. If you're already not coming from the presupposition that the Bible's good, that God is good, that religion is good, Alex has, has a point here, right? Now, again, I agree with Ben Shapiro, and I think God can and does work through incrementalism within the context of owning people within the confines of what he's talking about with war, within the confines of uh, polygamy. All of these things have gotten better. Society has gotten better as God through the more the, the objective standard has always been there, but because society was so corrupt, God would permit in their corruption specific boundaries. And then over time, these things got refined because of the Bible. I mean, it seems that a moment ago you say that the great the great success of religion is providing a sort of uh, untouchable moral basis that sort of transcends human affairs and human debates. And now when I say, well, look at this, open your own religious scripture and look at this blatant immorality, you say, yeah, but well, that was considered to be fine at the time. It's considered to be uh, bad now by the progress of Judeo-Christian there, 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 values. There's a question. Uh, Who's the moral relativist? Here? Well, that's not, it's not relativistic to say that the that a thing that is wrong today is considered wrong today because of a tradition that developed over time. The that's, question that's I'm asking is, is not, was it considered right or wrong at the time it of was, biblical it slavery? Was wrong. Was it, it wrong? It was wrong then to hold a slave. 
Yes, it was wrong then to hold a slave, obviously. And also, if you are God and you are pragmatically attempting to woo people away from slavery, was it a practicable thing it, to simply, quote unquote, abolish slavery? Or is that his an idea for, for example, tradition? In I want to hear what you guys think about this. Do you think Ben Shapiro has a good response? I think this is a solid response. I think these are all kind of hard conversations to navigate, especially with how touchy slavery is in American history, right? Um, but I think these are good, good responses Ben Shapiro gives here. And I think Alex does a good job of pushing on this. In, in the book of Exodus, uh, God says, I, I think in chapter 21, maybe 22, uh, says that if, uh, if, if, you have a, if you have a Hebrew slave, you are to let them go after seven years. If that Hebrew slave comes to you with a wife, then after the seven years, you let them go too. If you give the Hebrew slave a wife and they have children, then after those seven years are up, you give the man a choice. He can go after the seven years as per, but you keep his children and his wife. Or, and here the scripture says, you know, if, if he says, I love my wife, I love my kids and my master, as if that's going to be one of the principal considerations, then he can stay with you, at which, at which point you take him outside, you pierce his ear like cattle and he becomes your property for life. Now, here's a suggestion, for example. Yes, chattel slavery was different. However, what he's talking, this is now talking about owning people for life. Chattel slavery, what makes it distinct is that in the, in the, in the Old Testament, slavery, would, would there would be a year of jubilee, there would be years where people would be freed up. Here, he's pointing to owning people indefinitely. If it was already established that Hebrew slaves go after seven years, and it's already established that if they come with a wife, they can go after seven years, then if I give them a wife and they have children, would it not be, it, it doesn't seem to me particularly revolutionary. It doesn't seem to me the kind of thing that would have caused such social discohesion that God just couldn't have found a way to do it, to say, well, why not let the whole family go free after those seven years? With the knowledge beforehand that if you give this, this, this Hebrew slave of yours a wife and children, they'll get to leave with them. That seems to me, for example, a minor improvement that would not cause this kind of revolutionary earth shifting. He couldn't have just gotten away with slavery. Maybe that's true. But something as obvious as this to me, it seems that if that is the case, that that could have easily been done, then the failure to do so and, and the, the keeping of that Hebrew uh, wife and their children as the master's property, that itself becomes an immorality that is, that is dictated. If I agree with your premises, I So Alex is basically arguing that God's immoral here, which is, which is, a, which is wild. With your, your conclusion, I think that the question is to how much social discohesion would it have caused to do a thing is an open question. I think the other question that, that sort of remains open here is, the, the incentive structure as to whether you accept a wife from your master, mm. right? So the, 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 I don't want to get into the abstruse. I mean, we can do this we literally need to, all day. We need and to and step from the past into the future. I mean, the there, there are 70 anyway, volumes so. of the Talmud that are literally about this sort of stuff, and then copious writings in terms of reinterpretation. Yeah, of we're hardly the we first can, people to talk we, about yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is not the first time these questions have come up. Um, and but I think the, the general point is is sort of one where either we can dive into that full time, and we, and you can spend your life becoming a rabbi, which you know. It could happen. Uh, it could, could happen. You, you, you have the beard for it. It's, hmm. it <laughs> your, your beard is further along than mine. Uh, or, or we can sort of you know, stipulate at the top that there are certain biblical interpretations that are abstruse and difficult, yeah. and that that has been a reality of religious life since the beginning. Well, I can which, agree with that. that. All right, so that's Ben Shapiro's argument. Like I said, there's certain passages that are hard. I think we'd all acknowledge that. There's, there's explanations for it. There's theories for it. But it's okay to lean into these conversations. I like Ben Shapiro's answer. I do think that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good pushback from Alex, but I, think I like Ben Shapiro, Shapiro's answer. I want to know what you guys think about this. Stuff. We see, according to the Bible, that prayer is extremely important in terms of us being transformed from the inside out when we get aligned with God's will. For the Christians watching this channel, I want you guys to implement these spiritual disciplines in your day-to-day -day life. And the only way I've been able to do this consistently is through writing down my prayers in a prayer journal that does a few things. One, it allows me to reflect and come to God humbly and ask him to move on my behalf. And two, it allows me to document my prayers, which ultimately helped me remember the very things that I was praying for and see the hand of God tangibly in my life when he answers them. So I would urge you, consider writing down your prayers. It could be in a blank notebook. It could even be on your phone. Or you could check out the one I personally designed and used for my own quiet time and spiritual discipline that I think will be a huge blessing. It's the exact structure and system that I've used for years to pray and be more consistent in my spiritual disciplines. You can pick yours up today by clicking the link in the pinned comment below. All right, I'll see you over there. Peace.